these days, Tony, you need little introduction, especially to my listeners, but I would love for you to just give us a brief who is Tony Riddle synopsis, if it's something you can do briefly. Um, I'm a human being. I'm a yeah. father. Yes, I'm a, congratulations. I'm a husband. Um, I'm also known as a natural lifestylist. Um, what does that mean? Um, I look at ways of living that are more in sync with human biology. Mm-hmm. Um, for us urbanites to find ways of living that are more in sync. Mm. Um, to enable us to really thrive rather than just survive. Yeah. And for some of us, we don't even realise we're just surviving because that's become the norm. Mm. You know, the myriad of autoimmune diseases and everything else out there that's just normalised. Totally. Really, that's not living a life of fulfilment, really. Um, so with that, I started out as like a, I think it was like a rewilding really in a way. It's the best way to attach to it. Before rewilding became like a thing a now. Thing, a thing, a hashtag. Now. Reconnecting, rewild hashtag. Yeah. Um, hashtag grounding. And so people kind of, I, I was I was put out on the pedestal as like the Captain Fantastic. You know, we were living in Ibiza for a start that helped that a lot. Mm. And I had a man bun and a thick beard. Mm. And we had wild kids. Like we literally just went around naked all day. So it, it made sense. Yeah. Um, and I guess my ego quite liked that one anyway. <laughs> but then something pulled us back into London and it just wasn't relatable really. So even when I, I was lo- looking at meeting publishers to, for a book and it, I think it was difficult for the publishers to, to relate to, to it. You, yeah. So suddenly I found myself in a position where a guy called Chris Connors, he has a thing called Bee Box. So he does a, a lot of work in five rhythms he coaches in and... Um, he has that same, he lives in Ibiza, does a bit of, a bit in, in London. He said, oh, this journalist wants to meet you. And it was an editor from Style magazine mm. um, to write a piece about the six best coaches mm. that are out there. And my ego was like, yeah, six best coaches. Um, but then we met and we started to discuss, she thought it was about movement. So she was then discussing movement with me. And I said, well, that's just, uh, that's one one modality, one component, one facet of this multifaceted being, this emotional mm. being. And that movement is just a physical need. There's other physical needs like sleep, rest, play, um, sunlight, food, yeah, yeah. digestion, human contact. But then there's a social being and there's a spiritual being. And really through the social self, we get to understand what our physical and spiritual n- needs are through templates that we learn in the early years. And she was like, wow, she's like, this is beyond what I thought it was. Sorry, I underestimated. Mm. I thought it was this. Can we just do a piece on you? And so I ended up with a double pager in Style Magazine, which then meant rewilding was in Style Magazine. Yeah. And with that made me think, wow, okay, people get this because it's about style and it's Mm. about nature. Mm. And so out of that, I guess, was born the natural lifestyleist. And then since then, it just exploded. It's Mm. kind of really interesting how that was suddenly relatable. Mm. Um, Me losing my hair, maybe, I don't know. Um, But yeah, it just, people started to see it and view it differently and then, you know, all along it was never woo-woo. I'd give natural studies and natural examples of things and we were being them and living them. And then there's science, the evidence-based science to back it up. And I think with the social media platform as well, I just put out what we're doing and what we're being and then Mm. suddenly I think people just see it differently. I'm not trying to ram anything down anyone's neck Mm. and forcing them to do anything. Mm. I'm just doing it and leading it by example, I guess. Yeah, I think... think Pretty much as the years go on, we need it more because the more we're evolving, the more technology is evolving, the more our lifestyles are evolving to not resemble what they were even 40 years ago, 50 years ago, you know, going back hundreds of years. The more I think, especially Londoners, will be seeking out people to lead them in rewilding because we are all you know, living disparate lives. We don't have so much of a sense of community. Um, And I think it's, yeah, I think it's kind of, it's it's so great that it's becoming more of a thing, but I also think it's logical that it is, I guess is is my point, because I think we need it so much more. Yeah, there's that level of disconnection, but there's also the, you know, there's the the amnesia that comes with it. So each generation is born into a new norm. Yeah. Right. So we could, we could discuss wildlife, for instance, can't we even say, right, 60% of wildlife has been wiped out in 50 years. Boom. So my Mm. kids now, their new template, new norm is a 50% reduction in wildlife. Yeah. 
And then when we call when we talk about rewilding a human, is then we have to say, well, where's the template for a natural being? Mm. Because we we understand wildlife. What about wild humans, right? Mm. How many of those? Yeah, have like been, how far back do we have to look? And how how many have been removed, right? Mm. So we're, we're basically flattening the planet, right, and turning it into this big consumerist model. But we losing sight of what it is to be normal. Mm. as in the biological normal sense. Mm. That's really interesting, this word normal, I think, because... Because um, normal is just what's normalised, right? That's, that's all yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and, and that's what I was going to say is that, you know, a lot of the things that I do on a daily basis, 99% of my friendship group would say is not normal. You know, like, I'm the wacky one. I'm the one that's out there turning all the lights off in the evening. I'm the one that's, like, barefoot in the mornings in the garden. It's really, I think it is going to be an uphill journey to kind of normalize the actual biological norm going forwards because it's just not common for most people. I mean, I know I live in a little bubble of people that are kind of into this sort of thing. What's your take on that? I think, no, Grace, I think, I think the bubble's, I think it's growing mm. because of platforms like this, right? Yeah. So you have a podcast and you interview people that are, that are also in the bubble, right? But they're all like these normality bubbles that are, popping off everywhere right it's about perception as well so don't forget that your your perception of this room is different to my perception of the room mm. so the, our realities our perception of reality is slightly off right mm. we're all this isn't is it reality exactly what it is it's mm. just our perception of the world which is mm. then driven by the first six years of your life right how you interpret the world what you've inherited in those early years so i i think how do we how do, how do we normalize any behavior mm. I think it's just being, it's just, just be. I think we we all just need to learn how to be what works for us. And we're all on different rungs of the ladder. And you might be things in your, your friends' behaviours that you don't see as normal, you see, but to them it's normal. Mm. So I kind of, for me, I've always just, I'm now, as, I, I remove all judgment and yeah, I just yeah. behave how I behave according to what I've normalised. Yeah. And for me, it's seeking out ways again that I find are more aligned with what my physical, social, spiritual needs are. Mm. And what I've learned is through coaching and through being mm. is that the the closer I can get to having those needs met, the happier and more fulfilled I am, right? Mm. And through coaching others again, it doesn't matter where they consider themselves to be, how happy, um, how successful they perceive themselves to be. Again, if, if their needs aren't met, they're actually, they're suffering, right? Mm. So the more and more I can, I can be, and find ways that are more in sync, the more I can offer them, the more they can see. And for us, as an example of a family, it's been, it's been amazing because yeah. over the last, I think it's the last couple of years, really. Firstly, it's now seeing a difference in my parents. Amazing. That's you know, good. because in terms of ancestry, like your, your, aunt, your parents, they, they're, they're not meant to be taught by their children, right? Yeah. So you can't tell your parents what to do. You yeah. shouldn't be telling your parents you need to live your life like this. Because ancestrally, it's an insult, right? So in terms of spiritually, that's not a great connection, mm. right? But if you're just being and they see a shift in you, and yeah. because their thing is they want to see you happy and they yeah. want to see you in, you know, in loving relationships and having communities, they want to see all that. Yeah. So if you can just be that without ramming it down in one's neck, then they see the change, right? And then it's like, oh, okay. So my, yeah, yeah. again, my parents are shifting, you know? And that for me has been amazing. It really has. That's been a, a huge one for me. I think on the run, we were out one day and it was like really... A challenge for me. I think it was I had to do. I was at the end of a thirty miler, and I thought I'll just check in with my mum. She said, "Oh, got to go. I'm just on the way to yoga." Yes, mum. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and then I did this last night, and I did this, and you know, no, I was just like, "Wow, okay, yeah. I haven't had to say anything." She's now just doing. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's all. It's always about leading example. We get people just messaging now, saying, "Oh, you know, um, what's the height of your table? We're now going to take the legs off our table. We listen to you on so and so." Whereas when I when that first started coming in for us, people were like, what do you mean you don't sit in sofas? Mm. What do you mean you don't sit on chairs? So then there's been the example of it, but the, but it's also when asked, you have the, you have to have kind of the for me, it's about having the science then to back it up. Right? Yeah, for sure. You know, it's like saying, oh, okay, there's a hundred different rest positions we can choose on the floor. Each of them, each one of those is a micro element of standing, the macro skill of standing. You go to Pilates to organise your posture. You go to yoga to do this. When actually, it's all symptom relief for sitting in chairs and wearing compromising footwear. Just, mm. just remove the cause. Mm. Done. Mm. And they're like, "Wow, okay, that makes perfect sense." Yep, yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, for as long as I can remember, actually, and like not to single out my dad, but um, just thinking about parents then, I mean, my mum is amazing. She will take on board. Usually she's, we're kind of on par with each other. She'll start doing something and I'll think, oh, that's great. Like, I'm going to do that. And then I'll go home for the weekend and she's bought herself, um, you know, blue blocking glasses or something kind of on the sly. Um, and uh, she's Brilliant. really pioneering my mum. And, you know, she does more kind of mobility and movement stuff than I do. But thinking about that, my dad has never, like he, um, he's never been able to sit. He just can't sit on the ground, just like literally cannot do it. And I think um, there are some people that will take on elements of things and will kind of actively change or adapt behaviors. And then there are those that are just really set in their ways, but also really happy, mm. you know, and, and actually just fine and living living a good life and being healthy and being content and being connected in in other ways, which I think are equally as um, fulfilling, whether that's through like community or mm -hmm. um, connections with others or through like a passion for music or something like that. It's, um, yeah. Again, all needs again, right? Yeah, needs, like really you know, tuning in. I creative think. needs, community, that's mm. a need, social need, mm. making human connection another need. Yeah. You know? So again, and, they're still getting the needs met. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that goes back to, to your thing of, of connection, you know, finding connection, but firstly with yourself, you know, tuning in, like, how do you feel? What do you need this morning? Do you need um, actually a big glass of water rather than a cup of coffee or something? But we, we're we all very good at kind of um, just, yeah, not dialing in to that, I think. And I, I personally with, with patients or whoever I speak to, I try and make people realise that in terms of their health, they're their own best doctors. You know, you know more than anyone else what your body needs. On, on. Yeah, I think, you know, it's because it's, it's again, because of the, the first foundations of life, right? So if, if in your templates you, Grace, fell over in those first years, right? Right. And you graze your knee... And Grace, instead of getting a cuddle or, yeah, you're going to be okay or whatever language, you're given a sweetie or a chocolate bar or something like that. Suddenly the perception of the chocolate bar or the sweetie becomes something deeper, which is yeah. the perception or the emotion of love or whatever or human contact. So we can, you know, again, it's 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 tough for some people. Mm, and again, it's where, it, and it's then having compassion always going into those first six years, you know, what is it that drives it? Because... We're talking about in, in, sometimes incredibly intelligent people, right? Mm. Really smart people that will come in and you give them the most incredible information and they go away and within minutes they're doing it's the same action. It's because there's sometimes there's an emotional yeah. attachment to it. And, and that's where other systems can come in, you see. So for me it's like I think breath work for me has become like the portal really. It, it's, it enables us to kind of put that subconscious stuff that we operate at and keep the gate closed between that world and the conscious world. Mm. So it's like you have a reticular activation system. It's like a gatekeeper between subconscious and conscious world. So the breath enables me, enables me to be really present and focused. And if I start to feel the five, six-year-old coming up, mm. right, because that's what happens when we're 95% of the time if we're not focused and we're not tuned in and mm. or we're, our stress is up or we're upregulated through stress, stuff yeah. creeps in. And we're, not, we're then operating like the three-year-old, the four-year-old, the five-year-old, depending where that is. And that might mean the Mars bar for some, mm. you know. Others mm. it might, you know, it can be crazy behaviour. It can be, mm. right, I'm going to go off and get drunk or whatever because I'm dealing with some really early stuff that I haven't quite found how to release it yet. Yeah. And I say yet because, again, for some that's now and some that's the next, the next lifetime, mm. you know. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, I completely agree. I think emotions feeling and sensation has a huge part to play in it just everything everything um absolutely i want to delve into state of mind the name of this podcast yeah yeah um i think out of all my guests so far everyone in their own way has encapsulated this idea of state of mind but in light of your recent barefoot running challenge um I think state of mind is is so applicable to you because I think it was, I think I was watching uh, a Happy Pair YouTube video and they said that on the day that they ran with you, you said your mind was hurting. And I just <laughs> thought that is so, yeah. so brilliant. And I just really wanted to to tap into this idea of the mind. And I mean, 
do you feel having finished that challenge do you feel a, a difference in your state of mind before and after <clears throat> i am i yeah i can i i am tony 2.0 yeah i've done i mean don't get me wrong i've done so much work i've done i've done so many ceremonies or you, know, you name it i've kind of been through the spiritual processes of trying to unravel stuff um, and then I did one ceremony, which was then with an African root, which is about going in inside internally rather mm. than ascending like ayahuasca ceremonies and stuff like that. So an opportunity for me to turn up the flip the subconscious up and then all the trauma came up. Right. So right. I got to say goodbye to trauma that would pretty much be governing everything I do when I'm not focused, mm. you know, Wow. and we yeah. don't realize we're doing that. You see? Yeah, yeah. So that enabled me to say goodbye to that stuff, which was incredible. And it's all stuff that every now and then would pop up and I'd I think I dealt with it or, oh, I'm done, you know, but I mean properly done. Mm. And so it's also changed my relationship with other stuff like addictions and things like that. Mm. So rather than having the addiction controlling me now, the mechanism of it and me saying, no, I can't go in that just in case this happens. Mm. I don't feel like I have that anymore. It's kind of like, Oh, if I do that, it doesn't matter. No. Mm. I, I don't feel like I'll keep going to it. I'll keep going to it. So I, I feel that recovery is recovering over and over and over and not actually dealing with it, whereas mm. this process was about flipping things up and letting the trauma come up. So I did that quite recently, mm. pre-run, which I went into because it, it basically is a rebirthing experience. And my thing pre-run was I had this... in intellectual story i'm going to call it intellectual story because we do this over time we build something and then we keep building it we're based on little bits of information here and there and we create the story right yeah i feel like you're speaking directly at me at the moment so i'm really so, excited about so mine was say. about my feet so i was born longest baby on record in reading hospital right and it meant my feet were curled up into my armpits so i had a deformity when i was born yeah so they had to keep putting my feet into plaster cast and every week they'd reset them to try and get back to what would be normalized foot shape right mm. and then i was put in boots with braces and so i uh, and i can only imagine this was the intellectual story how much would have been how much i would have been crying how much trauma would have been out there oh there's no one listening blah 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 the whole story my mum was traumatized by it yeah. i probably was screaming but no one's listening until i stop and then my parents take me to see someone for because i'm not talking so why am I not talking? Am I not talking because of that? So that was a whole story I had going on that I carried with me for years, right? Mm. And I then go to this ceremony and I wrote this whole report about my birth. And they were like, we can't believe how concise you are, Tony. Thought, Normally we have to really tease stuff out of people. And I was like, no, no, yeah. I've done so much work. It keeps highlighting all over the place. I know it's about these boots and I know it's this. And I'm in, I'm in this ceremony and then I suddenly see, like you suddenly visualize something. And I could see my, I could see an eyeball, and the eyeball turned into a head, and then the head beca then became a body, and then the body became the room, and then I see my sister as like what would have been, I guess, a five-year-old, five and a half-year-old, whatever, mm. and then I see me, and then I see her poke me in the shoulder and say, <laughs> "You're not going to talk. I'm talking for you." What? Yeah. And that oh was probably that, you know, so, so I got yeah. to see the trauma and I let it go. And, I, and, it, and, I, and it's so interesting because then also whatever happened within that, I think the mechanism with my relationship, with my sister changed in that moment as well. I let stuff go. Yeah. But I let the whole footwear, boots, all that stuff. I feel it's just completely just went, yeah. you know, the whole story of it. But I accumulated stuff over the years that gave me a story, mm. you know, but there's negatives and positives. The positives are that that's how I'm sat here today, right? Mm. Because that has put me on a longer path, path of being barefoot, literally barefoot on the path, right? Mm. And losing the shoes, I think, was part of it. The and that may, strapping. And that maybe your... is in there. And I had this strength. My parents say, you've got such strong legs. And I used to run yeah. everywhere barefoot as a kid. And so I guess that was in there. So that was, that was at the start of the run. So that was already, I think, Tony 1.5, mm -hmm. right? Along with all the rest of the stuff that had led me there. And as the run started to evolve and started to evolve, I, I went into it with, do you know what? I'm, I'm not concerned about the physical aspect of the run. It would never, I, I just, I was so, I, I truly believe this is what we're capable of. Yeah. This is what we can all we're be doing. Yeah. And it's, we're innately wild, connected empowered beings this is what wild beings can do, right? Yeah. We can barefoot run. Which I think is funny just to interject because I think, the people on the outside, all of us watching you, were worried about 
the physical aspects like how is he going to do that oh my god the injuries and yeah, that yeah. he's going to have we weren't really thinking so much about your mind well yeah and I, and I had this whole technical foundation of running right and if you get the technique right you minimize forces right and you become more efficient so that meant I could run 30 miles a day, get up the next day, run 30 miles, get up the next day, run 30 miles. And if anyone's done a marathon, they know what that experience is like for the next three days. Mm. So it just meant I had all these modalities, breath work and nutrition, plant-based nutrition, breath work, technique. And once all that was honed, the physiology was happier, the technique is happier, and therefore the mind can be happier of what you're doing. Mm. And therefore when all that's aligned, it enabled me to just go off and just, it was like going into deep meditation for six hours a day. Wow. Out on the road, like silent retreat, right? You're just out there, ding, 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 yeah, just yeah. ticking over on the road, and then stuff stuff would happen. I, I there was one, I think day four, I started celebrating. Like, oh, this is amazing. I'm amazing. I'm this. Early and, days. Yeah, like really, just <laughs> every. It was like the mind and the body had a conversation. They went away and they came back. They had a baby, and that was the process, right? And the process mm. was. I'm just being this. This is amazing. I'm just, I'm just, I get it now. It's what I do each day. And it happened really early, I think, just because of the level of mileage I'd done pre-run. So yeah. like I was already up to doing like crazy mileage each week right. to prep myself. To prep, yeah. And so, so then also going into it, then the mind's happier because you know you can get up and do it because you've been doing it, right? That's part of that. Mm. But then a thorn got in my heel on day four. Like immediately after going through this thing and going, oh, I feel like the process. Yeah, I but I didn't just sit in the process. I decided that I'd get on social media and start boasting about the process, right? That's all I can call it now. Yeah, this amazing thing happened, peeps, and I'm this and I'm that. And yeah, and my, I've become the process. And out of that came, I trust the process, I respect the process. I actually be remember Be patient that whilst in through. the process. And yeah. when you finally get to grips with it, it's all process, just be. And then bam, in went the heel, right, with a thorn. And it was like, that would teach you. Yeah. You know, you were meant to just be processed. Why don't you just be processed? You yeah, weren't yeah. being processed. You weren't being present. You just basically went straight up to dictator mode. I'm this, I'm that. And then there's only one place to go, and it was victim. And it was straight into victim mode. So I, I then had to kind of, couldn't get the thorn out. Really hurt. And like every step, like walking was impossible. It's actually more pleasant to run at that stage than it was mm. walk. And then I had... I did 120 miles like that for over the next days. And that's when I, I think I then had Sophie and Chris mm -hmm. over. So they saw me, I was looking pretty trash. I was yeah, like yeah. hobbling around sore and and it's because every everything went out. And so once the physiology was then compromised, it meant little niggles were getting into the mind and it was having to really get, get through that process to get mm. back into the body is literally a vessel for the mind. Mm. And you have to be so strong in there. You have to just, you know... And then I could tune into the technique and there'd be moments when I'd be dragged out of that back into the heel, the thorn, mm. right, back into that. And then the pads of my right foot were wearing out because I was overstriking. So the, you could start to see the vest, blood vessels beneath my right foot. And then it split because the skin got so thin. And then even to put my foot on a carpet meant it hurt, let alone run on the road. So then I was in like the pain cave. I was like, yeah, oh, my yeah. God, this is, and this is so early in the run. And then... It was amazing. It was so good for me, that process, because it meant all the story about me, oh, this, you know, we should all be able to do this, all this stuff. Again, I had to just put all that one to one mm. side and say, well, that, this could be it. This, mm. this is adversity right now. Mm. And let's see how much work you've really done. Mm. Let's see how much work Tony has really done to be able to deal with the adversity. Because the point of a challenge isn't to run 30 miles a day for 30 days. It's to have a real pilgrimage, right? What is it I'm going to, what lessons am I going to get? And those lessons might come from day one and not being able to complete the 29 days afterwards. Yeah. So as soon as I could get my head round into, right, this, this is just, again, this is the process, right? This mm. is, oh, it's quite obvious. I've just been thrown back into what the process is. Mm. So let's just be. And then healing started to happen. And then I was back out on the road. But then... You know, I, again, having these huge, profound insights all the way of what human potential really is mm. and how we can heal. And then getting right to the end on day 26, halfway through the day, I, I, I was trying to get through some woods and GPS wasn't working. No idea where I was going. <clears throat> and then... I was trying, and then suddenly I could hear this woman like on a phone, like on the hill somewhere. It's like random woman in the middle of the woods on she her was own. She's calling just you. on her own on a mobile. I was like, what the fuck? So anyway, so I ran past her, and and then and then suddenly saw uh, there's a trail. Ah, oh, okay, I can get yeah, down yeah. to the trail. 
and I had to get across some walk, water and I hopped across the water and a rock moved, bam, ankle went. So I gave myself an upper ankle sprain right at the end pretty much of the run. Mm. I was like, wow, I kind of just at that space again where I was yeah, like, yeah. the end is here, right? It's here, I'm right yeah. in sight of the finish line. And now it's called James up to come pick me up. Can't walk on it, can't run on it, can't do anything. And when it was going through moments again where it, I could walk, then that became too painful, right? Let's run, that became too painful. Mm. And I probably did five miles like that, I guess, just mm. again, trying to tune in. And the more I could tune in, I could find ways of relaxing it. Mm. But again, the physiology is compromised. And then eventually it was like, no, it got to the point where, no, you're not lifting your feet from mm. the ground. I will not let you lift your feet from the ground. Mm. And then you're just stuck trying to, the mind trying to convince the body to move yeah, and yeah, there's yeah. nothing there, which is amazing. Like protection mechanism, the conversation yeah, the between the so two. Yeah, the body is so powerful, yeah. And then, and then I, went, we went, I went back to where we were staying and, of course, the family are there. So the kids immediately like, oh, you know, hey, Papa's not looking good. Oh. And Millie had already seen me like way at the beginning when I was sobbing with my head in my hands. You know, yeah, it was the first time they... Yeah, hard for them as well. Why I, about I you? think it was great for them. It was really important for them to see vulnerability like that from what they perceived as like super dad you know my brother can do everything mm. and suddenly wow he's a human you know it's really really great I, I i was i think that out of the whole experience was probably the most important thing that they saw me cry do you know mm. what i mean they've never seen me cry no. i i have i mean i hadn't cried for years right? yeah, i mean yeah. katarina's seen me cry so yeah. you know it's imp- i think it's good for everyone all round to get a hit of that you know yeah. that side of the masculinity so that so that that was that so then this this time i arrive home and the girls are kind of really sweet they, they open up the door and they put their hand in they do the seat belt and then oh. they pull me out of the car and i go hobbling into the house and then they're all around me you know just yeah, trying yeah. to bring in that healing energy and then you okay papa yeah i'm okay yeah i'll be okay you've got this you're not going to quit are you papa and i was like no I'm definitely not going to quit yeah if I have to crawl it, I'll crawl the rest of the. I had 134 miles to do at this stage, right? I'll crawl it. I know I will. So, um, but I think we're going to take tomorrow out. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. You want to go to Loch Ness anyway, don't you? Yeah, okay. So off they went. They all went out for the day to Loch Ness. I stayed in and I just, whatever came up, just came up. Mm. So that might have been crying with my head in my hands again, my feet, like in an ice bath, just mm. head sobbing in my hands. And then what I, what I needed to do was get through that what I call the I call it a pain cave, right? And I go into the meditation of it and there's a grizzly bear at the back of the cave. Yeah, I remember, yeah. And he's sitting on a log, right? And I go to the back of the cave and I sit down with the bear and I have a I have a conversation with I the bear. Love it. So. And this bear was, you know, you're um you're much more powerful than I am. You get to choose whether you're in the cave or out the cave, whereas I'm stuck back here. Yeah. And that was enough for me. It was just boom, okay, I'm gonna do this. And then I, I was just going from freezing cold ice to hot apple cider vinegar freezing cold ice epsom salts hot and it started to get just that um movement in i guess compression mm. activation again and then i could already see that the inflammation was going and going and going I was smashing mm. turmeric teas and yeah, yeah. golden milk pretty much all day and then loads of sleep when i needed it and if i needed to cry it was like i just recognized it as what needed to come out of the body and then I was getting these incredible messages off people. Like Dave and Steve were on there. Justin, have you met Justin over there? Yeah. Justin Caffrey, he's, like, yeah. he's a med- great meditation coach. Over there. He was on, he was amazing, he was really great. This is, this is everything you've been training for is this. You're the, yeah. you're the, um, you know, you're the, you're the minority of the minority of the minority of the minority who's doing this. Don't forget you're doing this, right? Mm. You know, and that got conversation. Then Rich Roll was on and Rich mm. was like, Tony, you know, I've been in the pain cave. I I've done challenges, not as extreme as what you're doing now, but I've been there, I've been in the pain cave. And mm. Don't forget, everything you've done up until this moment in time is about this event that you're doing. Mm. So you've got this, I know you've got it, you know? Yeah. And then so stuff like that was going on. And, and I had to tune into that because the other message is like, you know, man... You've done it. You know you can. It's fine to give up now. Oh God! You can give up now. It's no. perfectly fine. No one's going to judge you for it. Have you thought about doing? Uh, no, you know, and others like. Have you thought about doing a 31, 32, 33 day challenge? Why does it have to be a thirty day? Why don't you just stay another week and do it so you complete it? Right. Yeah. 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 And so you you have that. Right? Probably coming from <clears> a place <throat> of compassion, but still. Oh no, not criticizing it. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. No, they're because no, no. they can see like my foot was like it, like it was like I had an mm, elephant's yeah, foot, it was right? Huge. It's like horrendous. Like, oh, my yeah. nails are going to pop off. Oh. And so 
you know, it's like the nutty professor, you know, when his feet get big, that yeah. kind of scene, yeah. or Incredible Hulk or something like that. Um, so I had that going on. And of course, it's it's a good place it's coming from. But for me, it was like, right, I can't, I just can't have that information. I mm. have to just go into this. And I had a, uh, a, and the same, I had a conversation with my mum. My mum coming in of, of like the care coming in. I, you, you don't have to do this. We can just stop now. Yeah. You know, you do this. And I said, look, I need, to, I need every bit of positivity you can possibly give me for that now. Because... Mm. I'm your son. You know me better than anyone. There's no way I'm not doing this. Mm. You know that. So give me what I need to do it. Mm. And, that's all I, and that's all I could do. And so then I think Ross Edgley called it stubborn, um, naive enough to start and stubborn enough to finish. And I'm a stubborn bugger, right? So mm. for me it was like, right, I know I, can, I know I can do it. I just had to get back out there to do it. And I think the, the, the initial stage of that day 27 was just the fact that it hurt to stand up. Right. But the transformation by the morning to the following morning to then go out and run 30 miles is just, for me, it's hard, even now it's hard to get my head around yeah. what was going on there yeah. because I just did it. Yeah. And James, it was James, James is, James is, I mean. There with you the whole way, yeah. You know, he would say, Catherine said, oh, it's so interesting. I get to see two Tonys. I, I see like all these stories that he's putting out there on Instagram. And then I get to see him in the evening when he's like broken, mm. he's tired. And, and he said, I've seen eight Tonys so far, Katarina. <laughs> I've counted eight of them. You know, because I just allowed just be, I felt yeah. that just being as in being the process and being present mm. was much more healing for me. Mm. So whatever came up, I could just be it. But at the same time, I had to flip the healing process. So when I say about perception and that subconscious and the gatekeeper and what reality is again, my reality had to be, I, I need, I'm, I'm doing this. Mm. So every bit of my perception had to shift towards the doing, not the undoing of it, mm. you know? And then I think we have huge potential. I yeah, think if yeah. we really tune in and I I think probably the 26 days of meditation a daily practice of out there running and breathing and tuning in and being in really deep nature mm. enabled me to find something far beyond what I'd found before I guess yeah. going back to that that day four um <clears throat> what did you call it you said you were so quick to to jump to that dictator dictator phase why do you think as humans we do that because we do we do, we love, you know, when we feel like we've found something or like enlightened or achievement, we're really quick to tell everyone about it, aren't we? And it's interesting that you're undoing the thorn in the foot. So it's all sounding very biblical, isn't it? Came the day after. Why do you think you were so, why do you think you jumped to that dictator stage? Um, I don't, I, at the same time, I don't, I don't think it's coming from a bad place. You know, I think it's just what's, it's, it's inherent in a way. It's inherited. We learn it. It's a learned thing. Yeah. You know, to be proud of what you're doing, you know, we're not taught to live in divinity. No. Yeah. Show off your achievements, all of that kind of you stuff. Know? Yeah. So whereas with our kids, instead of us going, you know, we're really proud of you or we're this, it's, you must be really proud of yourself, you know. Nice. Yeah. You know, you flip it. So, so yeah. Um. So I, I'm not looking, it's, there's looking for approval, you see, in that moment mm. at the same time, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. Do you find There's it, that voice. Yeah. In me, I know. You do know. you find um, with your kids, do you get frustrated at, at the world that they, that we all inhabit? That the fact that maybe, you know, they go off to school for eight hours a day and do things differently to how maybe you've taught them and they've grown up does that kind of you know and, and the future of, of the kind of planet and like the world that we're all going to end up living in does that kind of how does that play out in your mind how does it play out um well firstly we unschool so our kids don't go to school okay and we don't teach them a curriculum so they're child-led learn mm -hmm. learnt they learn through play mm -hmm. um they don't we don't ram anything down their necks that they're not being absorbent to. So therefore there's neg no negative connotation towards what it is they're learning. Mm. Therefore their education gets amp ramped up and amplified very quickly. It's just absorbing so much information because I, okay, I'm really interested in that. <laughs> Gone. 
Like yeah. if you're interested in something, Grace, you know how quickly it is to absorb it. They're in that the whole state the whole yeah. time. And also they're because they're young, they're in their brain frequencies are in a form the same level of what we can achieve in meditation and breath work. They're mm. in that the whole time. So we don't pull them out of that. And they just sometimes we can be at home and they're just playing like all day. And you're mm. like, what, what? They, they're just playing. They just mm. play all day, all day long, like different characters, different beings, different this. Um, and the close example is like Peter Gray's work. He wrote um, Free to Learn mm. and they looked at, uh, he asked 10 anth leading anthropologists what, what childhood looks like in nature and they look at uh, three independent tribes and again they come up with, well, kids just play from infancy through to oh, the right. age of 16. Yeah. And they learn everything they need to learn about that environment in their state of play. And that then carries them into adulthood without any adult intervention. So the adults don't teach them, they observe they the don't. adult behavior, but yeah. they also observe nature. So they get a natural outcome. So they've been the plants, the rocks, the animals. Therefore, they have more empathy, compassion, and they understand they are that. Well, that's as close as you get to one consciousness when you've been everything, right, I guess, mm. right? Um, so sustainability in the environment, what better beings? Because they have actually been it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're not separate of it. Yeah. So they are the ecosystem, not the ego system, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the difference is in the human zoo is that the behaviours the children are learning is not of a natural being or the biological norm. So for me, again, it's I, I just have to be the best example of a human being for my kids to mm. them to observe that behaviour mm. so that becomes normalised for them. And then my other work is then working with um, the adult community to rewild the behaviours that were once ooh, over there innately wild, connected and empowered mm. to get them back to this behaviour over here and for these to be able to observe that for it to become normal. And then there's somewhere in the middle is like the human zoo environment, which mm. is, I think, plays out through school. I think school is a... Human it's a tough zoo. one that you're, again, you're handing the responsibility over yeah. to the schooling system. Yeah, and yeah. we forget that, don't forget, the same um, teachers, unless they've had their, re, unless they've been rewilded, reconnected and empowered, they're also humans in suffering, not getting their physical, social, spiritual needs met. So our kids are learning from suffer, suffering humans mm. that also probably still go out and self-medicate with alcohol, mm. drugs, shopping, sex and everything else that comes mm. with it and our kids are in that frequency for the whole day so that's part of why i don't we don't mm. send our kids to school and we unschool them mm. and i guess and, and i guess it, it enables um th free thinking that they just you yeah, know they yeah, just yeah. empower you just empower your kids that way we're fortunate enough to be able to do it right yeah um <clears throat> and i think outside of that is for 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 the parents to understand that's what the system their kids are in and then what can you do to enable your kids to be, for you to be an empowered being? And I think for me as a, as a father, there's certain stuff that I've really worked on and I found that to stop my inherited domesticated language coming in when things were ramped up. Because remember, we keep going back to the, between the first seven years of life. So mm. if I get stressed out, I might hear the children are meant to be seen, not heard comment come into my head. Or why did they have to be so loud? Why does he have to keep tapping? Why did they have to keep doing this? Because it's stuff I maybe inherited. Mm. So I, I will, if I hear it, I could say it, but I have to get into their frequency so play doesn't bug me, right? So before I go home, I'm already trying to walk 10% slower than anyone else around me, right? So mm. I downregulate. So and then I observe everyone's behavior, how much of a rush they're in. We'll all probably get there at the same time, just I'll be super chilled out, right? And I arrive at the door and I do cycles of nasal breathing at the door. And then I walk in and then I'm at a pupper frequency rather than, you know, compromised pupper frequency. Mm. And I immediately see the world differently because those kids have been waiting for me for sometimes eight to ten hours. Yeah, yeah. Really excited about seeing their dad arrive home. So what kind of dad do I want to give them? I think that's, that's one tool. And then that's we amazing. talked about morning rituals earlier didn't we and I yeah. think the morning rituals are an opportunity to get that going as well and for them then to see that so they see that that's normal not um scrolling through my phone smashing a coffee whilst eating half a slice of toast with some jam on it mm. and then getting around rushing around rushing to get rushing yeah. to get ready 
and then I normalize that. It's a bit like normalizing, oh, I'm going to an exercise class. I wear really serious clothing to go to the exercise class and I put my shoes on. Mm. And it's very specialized. Whereas kids just want to play, right? Mm. And they want to play. We had that domesticated out. So I teach adults how to play again, right? Mm. And somewhere in that same schooling system, the frustration of the schooling system is you, Grace, would have gone into a school with a play mindset and you would have played and played and played. And then you would have explored your physicality through play and in an environment and and it would have been adult-led to a certain extent and there would have been fear from the teachers in that environment that not to do this, not to do that, mm. just in case. Mm. And then that play was then removed and turned into a lunch break and then your play turned into a, a the act turned into a serious subject called physical education. Mm. And physical education means that it's specialised. Not everyone's good at it and it creates negative connotations then to how you move your body. Mm. And movement is a a really fundamental need that is stripped out completely and not respected in a school system Mm. where you're taught to sit for hours, be quiet and listen. Yeah. And yet when when, when we approached unschooling, the first flag that was raised from my parents was how are you going to socially integrate your children? Mm. And I was like, well, how did you socially integrate in school then? if you're taught to be in a classroom of all the same age group, none of you are allowed to speak, share or do anything. And you listen to an adult, again, that's probably in suffering, you know? Mm. And that's then the community community that you're being um, immersed in. Mm. Whereas unschooling is completely different because our kids get to integrate with all age groups. Mm. They have no problem with sitting here and having a conversation with you, you see. Mm. And they're also there's so many groups and networks that you can connect with yeah because we live in that world now we yeah. live in this amazing social platform we can go okay where's the where's the unschooling group on facebook yeah, yeah. wherever we move wherever we go to there's something you can tap into mm. and then we go and then they go to forest schools so they go to an unschooled forest school so they spend a whole day every thursday in nature no matter what the weather they're there with all different age groups nice. again yeah yeah so for me, it was always, <clears throat> you know, I had, a, I had a terrible education. So that's part of the seed within that. Mm. And people say, oh, it's just because you had a bad... Well, actually, Katerina didn't. She's got a master's in psychology. She was a teacher. She's been a nanny. And for mm. her thing, it was like, wow, why would we put our kids through that same yeah, system? Yeah. Because yeah. it's... Unfortunately, we're, you know, we're all born again, uniquely wild, connected, empowered. We're all unique as well. So imagine how the world would look, right? Rather than raising independent people, like you're an independent, you've got to work hard, you know, work to be an independent person. And what about if you went into a schooling system and they understood what, what is Grace's unique thing that the universe mm. has given you? Mm. Because we're all receiving anyway, but what's the, how's the unique way that you interpret what it is you're receiving? Yeah. Rather than being taught how to interpret what you're receiving. Mm through someone else's interpretation of what they see. Mm. I think, I I mean, I loved school. I had the most fantastic time, but I totally appreciate that that doesn't happen for everyone. But I think, like you were just saying then, I had no clue, like, what was, what my thing was at the age of 18 when I went off to university. I was still going to study a subject that I didn't really like. You know, I have a degree from Cambridge. What's that? It's not done anything for me. Like I, it was, I feel like I was, I learned how to think critically. Mm. And I'm <clears throat> so grateful of that because I wouldn't be doing this with you if I couldn't judge that conversation, steer that, you know, and that's because I've learned how to write an essay or whatever that yeah, may yeah. be. But it took, I mean, I'm 28 now. I'm still young, but it's like, I, I've only, I have I've never known, whereas I feel like giving kids the opportunity to just figure it out like you're doing when they're younger, they're in a much better position to say, this is what I'm good at and I really enjoy it and I'm going to make I'm going to make my my life from that. I think so yeah. many of us leave school just having no idea. Yeah. Do and we? also you give them the freedom to try everything they want to try mm. to weave and carve something out. I think, yeah. look, I, I think it's... Um, you retain like 5% of your education, right? Mm. Oh, God, yeah. I like literally don't remember anything. <laughs> so <laughs> the other side of it is like, okay, if, if I put my kids in a school, say, started the schooling system at five, right? Yeah. And then they went to uni and then they extended it and extended it. 
it's how many years in that system to only retain 5% of it mm. is quite disturbing. And I feel like what we learn, or certainly what I learned, was how to regurgitate information yeah, exactly. for an exam. Yeah. Because... You knew if you're good at exams, then it's great. Yeah. Like Katarina was naturally good at exams. She just said, I just... Yeah. Nailed it in my exams. Me too, but I wasn't the brightest <coughs> kid in the class by no stretch of the imagination, whereas, but I could... Whereas I could absorb loads of information. Yeah. But I just... Terrible in an exam situation. Yeah. You and know? that's unfair, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's not... Playing. But Ken's, yeah. that's not my skill set, you yeah. see. So this is, this is... That's the issue with it, you know? Mm. Whereas it seems unfair when you have the conversation, right? Mm. But it's not unfair. It's just the way the system's set up, mm. right? And it's not to say that I'm here now and you're here now. We're mm. on our path. Mm. We get there. Yeah, you know? yeah, you get there. Yeah. And sometimes it's someone could get there in a week and we might take 10 years. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's I, I actually quite like the 10 years because mm. I have so much experience in that I'm time. I'm beginning to feel that now. Yeah. I think for many years, I was incredibly jealous of friends that, you know, they the, the ones doing vocational degrees at uni, like they were doing medicine, they were going to be a doctor. It was obvious mm. what they were then going to do. I studied languages. I could I could do anything. But now I'm behind. I, I felt to begin with, I was behind everyone in career sense, but I've done so many random things. Like I've lived in the Caribbean. Like, you know, I've not worked more than I've worked. And I really like that. Actually. Yeah, it's a wealth of experience. Yeah, right? yeah, definitely. I forgot to ask you when we started, which is the first question I ask everyone. <laughs> what was it's all right? We're straight in. Yeah. It's all right. What was the last thing you did that positively impacted your health? It's the way I like to begin the. The pod. last thing. Mm. Well, today I went. I went to the ponds today. Oh, I'm jealous. So we did. Um, well, the guys from the Foot Collective. They're over from the US, and they were like, you know. I said, let's go and do some content. So maybe we can go to Vivo Barefoot because they're, yeah. they're in bed with Vivo as well. And I was like, you know, it's so nice mm. in the ponds. We went yesterday, took the girls, they took the girls there yesterday. Or? Well, they played a bit and they just said it was very different. Right. Because it was like I sat them down and we went through some breathing mm. and down regulating, not like the up regulating women stuff, but just down regulating again, yeah, just yeah. really long breath, oh, oxygen advantage. And um, yeah, I'm, a br- I'm a breath coach. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So XT, I've been, we've XPT. been using um, Eddie Stern's app. Okay. The breathing app. Mm. And it's been pff, brilliant, I would say. Partly because of the focus I think it gives people. They can actually really tune into the sound of this breathing app. And, mm. and the four seconds in, six seconds out is really working. And so with these guys, it was right, okay, we just breathe. And we breathe for five minutes. Mm. And then we went from there. Then they took a ladder each and the sun was just, it was beautiful, the ponds mm. this morning. We were at the men's this morning. And then I just look, and when you're getting in, just want you to just focus on the out breath. Don't out, focus on yeah. yeah, and just really calm and in they get. And then one of the guys was like, you could see, and I said, look, it's just two minutes. Mm. I just want you to focus on, you've got like six cycles of breath like that. Mm. That's a minute, mm. right? The next six. And then I guarantee when you get to two minutes, you're going to feel amazing. Yeah, yeah. And the two minutes hit and his face softened and he was just like, I I said, the, there you go, it's yeah. great, and then you're done, you know. I had the exact same thing with a. I've just um, started up a community group called Nudge, nice. and it's it's the idea is that just giving Londoners that nudge they need to kind of what the what we do is we meet every Wednesday at sunrise on Parliament Hill. We watch the sunrise together with a hot cup nice. of tea, and then we wander down the hill and we have a cold swim. And we've done five now, and I've been amazed every week at you know how many people have joined me for this experience because how how you know how many londoners can say they've watched the sunrise so so mm. few and um you know you've got the whole red light and you know making a mitochondria happy and all of this stuff and it's healing and that's not really what it's about it's about the community, the community and, I was and say, yeah, yeah. because that's what i want for londoners i want people to know that they can seek that out and they can find that and they can get into nature and last week um Mainly it's been people that, you know, they, they swim in cold and they're kind of, this is what they do and they've been joining us. Last week a girl came along who's never done anything like this before and she said, I'm really nervous. Like, I, is it going to be cold? And I said, it's going to be cold. You know, I think it was like six degrees and she was so nervous and, you know, like standing there on the um, the steps, getting yeah, into yeah, the yeah, lido, yeah. the squealing, but everyone that, that apart from my husband actually is the only person that's jumped into the ponds and hated it uh 
they just love it. Yeah. And I was so proud of her. I just said, just focus on your breath, breathe out slowly through your nose. You know, you can do that. And now she's like, I'm coming every Wednesday. I'm completely hooked. Yeah, I think it brings so much with it. I think it's the modern day equivalent of a rite of, it's a, like a rite of passage, really. Yeah. If you get people into ice baths or get them in the freezing cold And if cold you can pond, do that first thing before the sun's even up, like what, what, what can't you do? What start is it to the day? Mm. And then look at it as, you know, it's that micro hit of adversity. Mm. And then if you can remain calm in that, then you know, Build well, the that. stressful email, the stressful phone call is nothing, Yeah. you know? Yeah. But what did I put in place to be able to get in the ice and it remain calm? Yeah. You know? It's, an, it's a powerful tool and actually the, it's been one of the main things I've used in my own healing journey over the last few years. I've been yeah. like chronically sick since I was born, basically. And oh, it's wow. only in the last... 12 months that I've actually enjoyed less than 12 months that I've enjoyed what I would say is good health but all throughout that I've sought out at the beginning I didn't know you know there wasn't such a thing as like cold water swimming or like rewilding or whatever that was but I always came back to jumping into the ponds because if I could do that I knew that I could heal because it's such a empowering tool mm. I think yeah, yeah. And that's just nature. All well, it is is just going back to nature. Again, it's just immersing in nature. Well, it's like, you know, we do breath work to drop into a parasympathetic state, right? Boom. Go for a walk in nature. Mm. Same effect. Same thing. They've so flip books, you know, you look for a flip book, nature scene, ah, it drops into a parasympathetic state, mm. urban setting again, ah, sympathetic. Mm. That's just a flip book. Mm. So, you know, if you combine breath work and going out in nature, just even sitting under a tree, doing a bit of breath work, have your eyes closed and then tune in to the sounds and everything around you, you'll be amazed. It's, that's, a, that's a spiritual experience. Suddenly yeah. you'll, be, you'll become nature again. You actually yeah. really tune into it. Yeah. How fine it is, you know, how yeah. refined it is. The oh. frequency of it is beautiful. Totally. And just that colour green, I feel like it's just immensely healing, just surrounding yourself with that and just like really looking at the trees and like really looking at the green. It's just like, wow. And we're never, and the thing is, you're never too far away from it in London. No. You know? No. Yeah, we're lucky. We are. Well, we're, we're blessed, mm. right? We moved to Hampstead just because of because of the heath, right? Mm. We were like, oh, know. I would love to live on because the it... Highgate side of Hampstead near the Ladies' Ponds. It'd be so <coughs> good. Our friends actually, they they they've got a house and they look out onto the men's ponds. Wow! So you can then see, you oh know, you then gosh. see the hill, and you just from their terrace, it looks that looks yeah. literally down on the pond. Yeah, insane. That'd be the dream, right? <sighs> that would absolutely absolutely be the dream. And he came, he said, he, he's a he's a friend of mine. He had his hair all like wild like this mm. and he, he didn't have any shoes on came out in a towel was walking across the road to go into the men's pond and he said this um orthodox jewish guy gets out his car and he goes no no don't tell me and he's like what he said you okay he said 10 years i've been waiting to see what kind of man lives in a house like that <laughs> Oh my gosh. And it's my friend comes out like a wild being with his beard and bushy hair. Yeah. You know? I wonder what he thought, you know, he must have thought like, oh, someone that works in the city or like, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'd live there in a heartbeat, but I think um, Nick's a surfer. Uh, he grew up on a small island in Australia, just in the middle of bliss. And um, I think we're going to have to seek out some West Country at some point to get those waves in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we, we keep thinking about right, where are we going to move to, where are we going to move to, and London's not forever. And right, I've got certain things that pulled me back in, and mm. I'm working on a co-working space kind of with a developer now, and that's that's going to be great. It's an opportunity again to create something where people in the city can go to and it becomes like a lifestyle building, not great, yeah. um, somewhere you dread going to work. It'd be somewhere, right, okay, I feel great in this building. What is it? And mm. So we want to do that and then unroll and then roll that out. But for us, I think we'd be, I think the idea is in the future will be to have some kind of forest school thing mm. going on. I think, I think really just for the kids more than anything mm. to give them that real hit of the social tribe. Mm. And then have somewhere where we live that's, that offers gatherings, not not festivals, not retreats, somewhere in between. Yeah. So people can kind of just join the bubble. Yeah. You know? Lovely. That feels right to me. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap up with the same three questions I ask everyone. What are the questions? It comes what are the on questions? the card. Uh, the first is, what's one thing in life you'd do again if you could? 
Uh, what's what I'm saying? I'd, I'd marry Katerina again. Yes. Oh, my gosh. So you're the second person that said that about their partner. I love it. Actually, the, the, other, the other response was I'd meet my husband again. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think. Like the actual day, the wedding day was the special day? Or just generally do it all over again? I think I'd do it. I think, I'd, I think it's probably from meeting her through to that, yeah, I guess, if I yeah. really put my finger on it, yeah. I think having had people give because that to me... it's been amazing. It's been a complete yeah. transformation for me. She's been like, just, yeah, it's the best coach ever. Oh, I yeah, love yeah. that. I think I my, if I, anyone were to ask, ask me the same question, I think I might say the same thing because mm. it's funny how, you know, a moment in time is just a moment in time, isn't it? And you think back, you can never get back the same feeling you had in that moment. And I remember I met Nick, he was busking on Portobello Road. Oh, wow. And I just accosted him and I, I saw the guy and I, you know, heard him singing and I was just like, I have to go and speak to him. And then waltzed up and said, rather than saying hello, I said, you know, I'm probably a better singer than you. <laughs> and that was it. And if I could get that moment back again, I definitely would. Yeah, I, I had a Pilates studio in a health club. And I had my own reception area and then there was the reception of the health club. So it was like I had a business within a health club mm. and I looked across and there was Katerina standing there and um, I said to my mate, oh, he's not over there. She's new. And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, she's definitely new. So I strolled over and I just said, um, do you mind getting a piece of paper and a pen for me? He was like, yeah, sure. So he came over with a piece of pen and I said, now can you write your name and number down on there and I'll take you out? Yeah. And that was it. So smooth. Uh, yeah, it was pretty smooth, wasn't so it? So smooth. And it was less smooth as I took her to Gaucho Grill on a date and she was a vegan. So oh, I kind of we sat down on a cow hides and she just, yeah, she was fine about it all. How long did it take before she told you that she was a vegan? Um, pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. 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 But amazing. And I've always said, you know, all along that Katarina's kind of, she's, She's already at that level. She was probably at the Katerina, the, what I've been trying to find my Tony 2.0. Mm. She was there and I was mm. always just trying to get to that. Mm. People would say, what about Katerina? Is she doing any ceremonies or anything? No, I don't feel, don't, she doesn't feel doesn't she needs mean, to do yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. But I think also with childbirth, then she's had like what she says, four really potent kind of rites of passage mm. that have been incredible for her yeah, and yeah. us again. Amazing. Mm. Um, what's one thing you would change if you could? This can be it, the world at large or um, your life, anything. What would I change? What would I change? I Probably from my um, first marriage, I would have changed, not to save the marriage because it's the best thing that's ever happened. No, mm. I'm, I'm not married there. But I think I would have had more compassion, I think, for what my the behavior of my ex-wife mm, okay yeah nice and finally we've, we've kind very of cryptic that for the audience a bit, yeah. a bit cryptic we'll leave it there let well them, just there was stuff them. with you know our behaviors were toxic and there was addictions yeah. there and drugs yeah. and alcohol and stuff like that very different and um i had to save myself in a way mm. good and then um, the last question I ask everyone, we've, we've kind of touched on it a bit, but uh, what does state of mind mean to you? Um, clearly, I had enough experience with it. Um, for me, it's somewhere with that, the state of mind is somewhere with that reticular activation system. And it's about being, being the process and being tuned into what the process is. Mm. And it's about living in divinity and remove kind of and removing the any kind of language that's either towards being the victim or the dictator within it mm. that's my state of mind anyway is okay. to try and just be an example be more human mm. and with that means i can't be ah oh, you know i'm the best yeah or i'm the worst yeah somewhere in the middle yeah nice Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Well done. Great. <laughs> Super.